Today on the Region Free Gamers podcast, we're going to float like butterflies and sting like bald bull. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the Region Free Gamers podcast, the podcast fluent in gaming. Uh, you guys are in for a treat today, as I'm joined by none other, and by none other, I mean none other, like no one else, uh, than Paul Bearhugger Romalo. How are you doing today, Paul? <laughs> Thank God there's no more of me. <laughs> uh, and we're going to be discussing the history and, I guess, literal impact of uh, Nintendo's greatest rhythm game franchise, Punch-Out!, uh, I'm very excited about this. This is one that I think we've talked about doing before, um, but we never really found the time to do. And now I'm I'm excited that we're finally going to do it. You know, I don't even remember mentioning it, honestly. Like, it's been <laughs> on my mind forever because I fucking love Punch-Out! <laughs> but I just kind of assumed that the rest of you guys didn't really have any interest in it. And so I just never really brought it up, right? Yeah. And, uh... And then you approached me about it. You're like, hey, want to do a punch out episode? I was like, yes, <laughs> yes. And then we approached everybody else and they were like, nah. No. So you were <laughs> so almost you right. Me. You were almost correct. I was almost correct. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, thankfully you stepped up. That's right. So here we go. But uh, as always, before we jump into anything, I want to give a quick shout out to all our listeners, people who listen, support, review, rate. Uh, thank you guys so much. Um, you know, I think we're about two and a half years into this nonsense now and it seems to still be trending upwards. People still seem to be really enjoying us and listening and commenting. Despite our best efforts. I know, despite all of our attempts to end this show prematurely, people are like, <laughs> no, you will continue. Um, but thank you guys so much. As always, if you're listening, we love you. Um, if you want to do anything else for us, please rate and review on iTunes. Uh, that is unfortunately the best best way for us to sort of get the word out and for the podcast to be noticed um i know it's a pain but if you could that'd be great um and other than that i think we do have one more announcement paul is that right yes sir uh the announcement we actually now have a patreon account (laughs) which (laughs) i have pop horns (laughs) you know we've we've that's another thing we've talked about for ages right and you know the look the truth of the matter is, is that we're all gainfully employed Mm -hmm. and we've all at one time or another, especially with COVID, we felt kind of guilty. We're like, well, you know, we're all doing all right. We can, we can pay for this ourselves. But the, there's a couple things here. The costs, they do exist. Mm -hmm. Uh, We need stuff like server space and distribution. And uh, those have fixed costs every year. And we've been footing the bill till now. And that's fine. Like Mm -hmm. this is a hobby for us. We're, we're certainly not complaining. But, you know, if people want to contribute, like, here's the thing. We've had people ask us, like, hey, do you have a Patreon account? I'd like to contribute. Which, by the way, completely (laughs) shocking to me, right? Like, is it not like that for you too, Arnie? It kind of is. It, like, makes it just that more real. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, exactly. So we've had a couple people approach us about it. And we're like, you know what? If people want to chip in and they want to help out, that's great. Like, it'll just take care of the fixed costs for us. And, you know, we'll probably put money into something else if that happens. We'll probably put money into swag or whatever the case may be, right? I'm sure we'll think of something. The bottom line is we'll just reinvest it into the show. So, you know, again, this is a hobby for us, but it is one that we're really passionate about. And we do put a lot of work into it. And uh, yeah, if anybody wants to help out financially, that'd be awesome. And if you don't, that's cool, too. Like, we're just, (laughs) frankly, we're just happy that you're listening. Yeah. Uh, we don't have any tiers yet. We have some things that are almost finalized. Uh, but once this episode airs, the site will be up. And I think we'll have three tiers. And uh, I'm, I'm not going to, you know, kind of set it in stone now. You'll you'll see it when you hear this episode. You can go have a look at it. It'll be patreon.com slash region free gamers probably. And uh, if it's not, then, you know, we'll put it up on our social media exactly right. what it is going to be. So, yeah, that's the announcement. And so that's that's pretty much it, guys. Um, so with that out of the way, Paul, I think it's time to get to Punch Out. What do you think? I think so too, man. This game, I've I've been playing it like nonstop for the past couple of days, 
And it is... This game is the fountain of youth, dude. It's the fountain of youth. Like, a few weeks ago... So I'm going to digress here. Yeah. <laughs> big surprise. <laughs> so a few weeks ago, I was out hiking with my wife. We were doing this big multi-day trek up in the mountains here. And what happened was we were hiking along and my backpack was fucking killing me. Right. Like I was <laughs> and I was carrying a lot of I was carrying a lot in there. It was like probably like 40 pounds if I was to guess. Right. I had yeah. 10 days worth of food plus gear. Plus she had her backpack with all her gear and, and so on. Right. Mm -hmm. But my backpack was driving me up the wall. And I was complaining about it here and there. Nothing special. You know, we stopped a couple times. I adjusted the straps, you know, just to see if it would help out and so on. But man, it was brutal, right? <laughs> so about three quarters of the way through, my wife says to me, just let me take your backpack. I need to, I need to see what's going on here. Yeah. Because up until that point, she had been like, you want me to carry it? You want me to carry it? There's no fucking way I'm going to say to my wife, oh, my backpack's too heavy. Can you carry it? You know what I'm saying? Yeah, absolutely. So eventually, like three quarters of the way in, we're at about eight kilometers now. She picks up the backpack. She takes like three step steps with it. And she's like, oh, my God, this is horrible. How have you not been complaining more? This is like horrendous, right? And I was like, oh. I thought I thought this was just kind of normal because I've had this backpack for like five years now, right? Yeah. And we've done quite a few trips like this. And she's like, no, this isn't normal. Put mine on and you'll see what normal is. <laughs> and I put hers on and I did like a fucking dance. I was like, oh my God, this is unbelievable, <laughs> right? Isn't, isn't that just like, 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 I've been in that situation before where you sort of just... You adjust to your new normal, even if it, like, causes you, like, crippling pain. <laughs> You're just like, yeah, yeah. everybody must be going through this crippling pain, like. That's that's what I thought. <laughs> My wife was like, no wonder you're so miserable all the time when you're hiking, right? <laughs> so, what ends up happening is we get to camp, we set up our camp, and then I wake up in the morning, I've got back spasms, mm -hmm. and we have, to, we have to go back, right? Like, the pain is just not great. Um, I, I actually could have put up with it, but if we had kept going, it might have got worse. That's yeah. the problem. And we would have been deep into the back country at that point. Mm -hmm. It would have been like extra days worth of hiking to get back out. So we hiked back out. My back got better in a few days, but it was a little bit depressing. I was like, oh my God, I'm old, right? Like this is, if there was, if there was never any evidence of my old age, <laughs> now I have it. Yeah. However. A couple days ago, I picked up Punch Out. And Arnie, I was young and spry again. <laughs> it was awesome. I picked it up. It was like I remembered everything. And even Super Punch Out, which I hadn't really played very much before. Like, I played it once when I was a kid because a friend had it, but mm -hmm. we just didn't play it that way. Street Fighter 2, right? Yeah. I even played Super Punch Out almost for like the first time. Dude, I was so good at it. It was like all this muscle memory came back. I know. I the saw patterns. you tearing through the circuits. I was. It was It was ridiculous. I, I, <laughs> I felt awesome. <laughs> I felt young, uninjured. And uh, yeah, man, I, I'm super excited to talk about Punch Out. It really is kind of what I'm getting at in a very long-winded way. Yeah. Let me ask you this. I, I, I did want to have this discussion sort of before we dive into it. Do you, are you a boxing fan? Like when you were growing up, did you watch boxing a lot or dude, Mike Tyson when I was a kid was god. <laughs> was god. Like I because I guess you maybe maybe you know or maybe you don't know cuz you weren't alive in the yeah. 80s, but like back then main event boxing was aired on television. Mm -hmm. There was no pay-per-view. Yeah. So you had these titanic matchups that were just like on tv and everybody watched them mm -hmm. and everybody talked about them and mike tyson especially well we'll get to him when we get to him but yeah, yeah absolutely i was a huge boxing fan growing up if you were a sports fan in the 80s early 90s even the mid 90s really although mm -hmm. it was already kind of on its way down then because pay-per-view started happening like you you were a fan of boxing if you were a fan of sports you were a fan of boxing that's just that's just how it was 
Yeah, I remember the reason I ask is because I did grow up in that pay-per-view era. Like by the time I was old enough to sort of appreciate what was happening in front of me, it was all pay-per-view. But I was never a like I was not a sports fan pretty much until my college years. And even then, mostly until I moved to the States. But boxing was always a sport that when there was a big main event, like we would have a party, people would come over, we'd have like 10, 20 people, we'd, everybody would gather around the television and like watch the fight, you know, like you always oh, watch dude. the main event. Absolutely. I skipped my high school prom to watch Mike Tyson, Evander Holyfield 2. <laughs> and that was the one, that was the one where Tyson bit his ear off. Yeah. No regrets. <laughs> to this day, no regrets. It was me and eight of my buddies huddled around the TV at uh, at one of their houses. Yeah. And it was an event. That's an amazing. Event. It was more memorable than unless unless something very, very special was going to happen after that prom. <laughs> and let's let's not kid ourselves. It probably wasn't. <laughs> The Tyson Holyfield fight was definitely the right choice. Yeah, fair enough. I mean, you remember it to this day for a reason. Oh, man, what a night. Yeah, but I think the other thing, at least for me, was that growing up in Puerto Rico, like, boxing was the sport that I saw, like, us represented the most in, I think. Because we oh, had, yeah, yeah. you know, we, we played, the baseball is really big, basketball is really big, but boxing was sort of the one where we would stand out amongst everyone else because it wasn't a team sport. So I grew up watching like Tito Trinidad and Jesus Cotto and, and people like yes. that, you know? Um, and those were the sports where I was like, wow, like, this is us making the big time. <laughs> like, I was like, <laughs> this is it. And then when they yep. eventually started losing, I was like, God, that hurts. Like, when you have a guy and you see them and you just see him get beat to shit, you're just like, oh, no, please. I know. I know, dude. Like, I can only imagine how the Filipinos felt after Pacquiao got knocked out so violently. Yeah. I think it was by Chavez. Like, that knockout was so brutal. I could only imagine the entire country just like wincing all at the same time. Oh, my God. Uh. It's a hell of a sport, but so it's interesting that I think like Punch Out does similar things for me in that I'm not a huge fan of sports games just in general, and I'm not very good at Punch Out, but Punch Out just has like a draw. There's just like something about it that makes me like, oh, I want to play this. Yep, yep. It's you know what, man? It's by design. Yeah. It's by design. Like boxing at its core is the simplest sport, really. You know, like. It's not like, you know, American football where, oh my God, American football drives me nuts, man. <laughs> Every time a flag gets thrown onto the field, I lose my mind Yeah, because we stop <laughs> and everybody wonders why. Nobody knows why, you know, because the, the referee throws a flag to say, something's happened. Yeah. Give me five minutes to figure it out and then I'll let you know. Yeah. In the meantime, you can watch some, enjoy some commercials. <laughs> In boxing, this doesn't happen. Yeah. It's two guys punching each other. It is extremely simple. Mm -hmm. And I think that is the appeal, well, among other things, but that is one of the appeals of the sport. And so with punch out, you have left punt, you have left hook, right hook, and you have uppercut, uppercut, or, you know, whatever they are. They look, on the screen, they look weird. It, lo yeah. it looks like a right and left cross, yeah. but in the instruction book, it's called something else. Anyway, you have four <laughs> different punches. You can dodge left, you can dodge right, you can duck, and you have one button for a super punch. Yep. That is it. Mm -hmm. That is it. The game is extremely simple. You can give it to a child and they'll figure it out pretty fast. Yeah. Now, after Glass Joe, they'll get destroyed. Yeah. But that's not the point. The point is they can figure out the mechanics very simply, and I think that might be the appeal. That's right. So we're just going to go ahead and dive right into the arcade origins. But before we do that, I just want to say, Paul... Ooh, let's get ready to podcast. There you go. Um, so Punch Out um was a series created by Genyo Takeda and his partner Makoto Wada. Uh, we should know who Genyo Takeda is. I think he's another one along with uh Miyamoto and a couple other guys that are sort of big names in Nintendo lore. Um. I think Genyo Takeda might be a little more understated. Like, he's not a guy you hear about, obviously, as often as uh, Miyamoto. Um, but nonetheless, I would say 
very, very important in the development of Nintendo. At least the Nintendo yes. we know nowadays. Um, yes, absolutely. He like the thing is he's mostly a hardware guy. Yeah. Right. And the hardware guys like like Gunpei Yokoi, yep. they don't quite get the love that Miyamoto san does. That's and right. you know, that's that's understandable because Miyamoto is you know the top of the he's the guy yeah he's, he's on top face. of mount everest right yeah, yeah. exactly and, um, and well deserved yeah but genyo takeda absolutely is right up there that's right so takeda joined nintendo in, in 1972 and he eventually became general manager of nintendo's ird or integrated research and development division which like paul said mostly handled development of home and handheld consoles and peripherals um but they did work on games and arcade machines including punch out um Miyamoto sort of considers Takeda the Nintendo's first game designer since he produced EVR Race uh, in 75, which I believe was Nintendo's first uh, arcade machine. Is that right? Yeah, there's there's some debate about that, but it's generally accepted that EVR Race was Nintendo's first arcade machine. Mm -hmm. And uh, really, really interesting looking when you actually have a look at it. It's basically a, a horse betting simulator. So you put in a quarter, you bet on the horse, and then, you know, if your horse wins, you win. Yeah. I don't know what kind of prize payout there was, if any. Probably just, you know, pride. Yeah. <laughs> but <laughs> that was that was what the game was like. And it was played on... Uh, so the EVR stands for Electronic uh, Video Recorder. It's like a... It's almost like a, a small movie reel. Okay. And uh, And that's how they... And there were a whole bunch of recording mediums back then prior to you know, VHS kind of dominating the market. Yeah. And uh, the EVR was one of them. So it was like, just imagine playing a video game where your game is like on a VHS tape. <laughs> and that's kind of what EVR is doing. Yeah. So, you know, interesting stuff, man. I think that was their first one. 75, 75, man. man. It's, it's crazy to think that Nintendo's sort of roots in video games go that far back. Um, it's amazing. Yeah. I think most people think, you know, Donkey Kong, right? But no, even before that, they were they were sort of dipping their toe in that in that pool, not knowing that they would shortly thereafter submerge themselves in it completely. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Um, but IRD also worked on a couple of other peripherals that people may have heard of. I don't know if you've ever heard of the N64 Rumble Pack. I have. The N64 DD, the Wavebird, which I was very I was very excited by cuz the Wavebird is I don't I don't know. Do you get this impression? I've always felt that like people always talk about how great the GameCube controller is, but the Wavebird is like the next level of GameCube controller. Like if you have a Wavebird, like you've made it. Yeah, yeah. No, the GameCube <laughs> controller is a Toyota. You know, it's it's solid, it's dependable. The That's Wavebird right. is the Lexus. There you go. Exactly. Um the Game Boy player, the Wii and Wii U Pro controllers, which I think are essential peripherals to have for both of those consoles. Yes. Like, if you don't have a pro controller, you're really missing out on the full potential of those systems a little bit. Um, and the 3DS and the 2DS, uh, which I love. But R&D 3, which was a uh, part of IRD, was their sort of game development arm. And so they worked on Punch-Out!, Super Punch Out, Star Tropics, Star Tropics Two, Pilot Win sixty four. I mean, all winners in my book. Not not a not a dud among them. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> a, Pilot Wings showed up. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so obviously, Punch Out Arcade was the original sort of Punch Out entry. It was the first, um, at least the first recognized. We'll get into some of the spinoffs later on in the episode originally titled knockout which i like you would think knockout would be the better name to describe what you're doing but punch out just like feels better to say in my opinion yeah i i agree 100 percent um sort of came out early 80s japan 83 north america 84 europe early 84 um and so basically what you see is they were trying the 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 sort of development behind punch out my understanding is that they sort of had excess monitors because of some uh cabinets that they had developed that sort of didn't work out and what they eventually decided to do was to do a vertically stacked dual screen setup machine and so punch out when you see it in an arcade and i i remember the first time i saw a punch out cabinet sort of being really confused but impressed by it because 
it, it sort of has that... We've talked about this before where one of the big draws in arcades was you could always tell when a machine was popular because people would be crowded around it. Yes. And Punch-Out sort of added to that by putting sort of fighter stats, t- rounds, times. You could see, like, the portraits of the characters that were fighting on top. So even from far away in the arcade, you would be like, oh, there's something happening there. Like, I, I know that something's going on. And so yes. I was sort of drawn to that machine every time I saw it in an arcade. Um, I obviously saw it much later when it wasn't as popular. But, Paul, did you sort of get to see it in its initial run, like, did you run into a Punch Out machine? Dude, I didn't even know that Punch Out was an arcade game until I saw it at a modern, you know, bar slash arcade. <laughs> One in Toronto. I was like, Punch Out? And I saw the two screens and I was like, what is going on here? And I tried it out. Mm-hmm. It, you know, it's it's a different game than the NES game. It's, it's very similar in some ways, but the... Uh, it doesn't quite have that, you know, Simon memory game aspect yeah. to it that NES Punch Out does, and the controls aren't quite as responsive. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's weird, man. Even also playing it, the the digitized voices impressive. Oh yeah. Right? However, they are repeated over and <laughs> over and over. Every time you throw a body blow <laughs> the guy makes sure to tell you body blow uh, body blow yep. body blow <laughs> i'm like oh jesus christ i'm just gonna get knocked out here so i don't have to hear body blow one more time <laughs> so yeah it's a it's a very interesting game yeah i think that was sort of an incentive for you to mix it up <laughs> <laughs> they're like you can you can keep doing these body blows it's clearly working but you're gonna have to listen to this guy say it every single time <laughs> But, uh, but no, that was another thing is like, you know, there was, there was definitely this thing where I'd be playing another game, but I'd be thinking of punch out because in the background, all I'd be hearing is body blow, body blow, uppercut. (laughs) (laughs) And I'm like, all right, punch out. All right. I I get it. I'm going over there. Like you've convinced me, you've beat me down. Um, you know, it was, it sort of was. I I like the dual monitor aspect of it because not only is it sort of eye catching, but it keeps the bottom screen sort of free of all this extra frill, very unobstructed sort of UI on that machine, which I think is great because the thing that's sort of the other really visually captivating thing about punch out is those giant detailed boxer sprites, right? Like, you they sort of made your guy wireframe so you could see through him to the guy that you're facing. And they did a really good job. I thought uh, Wada, I believe, did the character designs for a lot of these. Or no, it was Miyamoto in the um, arcade yeah. release. Yeah, Miyamoto did, did the them. character designs. That's right. Um, and he did an excellent job. I think that there is obviously, you know, when you're talking about Punch-Out, there's always the the sort of... <laughs> the sort of cloud hanging over it of some of these stereotypical characters that they design. But in terms of the character designs, the pixel artwork that we see at play here, I thought Miyamoto did a, a very good job just making very detailed and sort of as real to life as you can get boxers. I I agree. Yeah. And the technology was new too. like one of the reasons that they that they used the dual screen was because mm. they had this new scaling technology. So you'll notice in punch out and you'll notice it especially the best place to see it is in ball bulls, bald bulls, bull charge. Yep. Where he backs up to the ropes and his sprite kind of scales smaller and smaller. And then he rushes at you to deliver his uppercut and he gets bigger and bigger. That was Terrifying. completely new at the time. And funnily enough, they couldn't do that with two screens they could Mm. only do it with one screen so that was how they ended up with the kind of boxing marquee as the top Mm. screen with all the information and then all the action happening on the bottom it was almost by accident and then it just worked out beautifully isn't that isn't isn't that usually how it it works out with a lot of these (laughs) things it really is it's like we never (laughs) planned this we it just ended up this way yeah um and i gotta say man you know we all we all worship at the altar of Shigeru Miyamoto, <laughs> except maybe Ozzy. Yeah. <laughs> He's a heretic. 
but like you see i saw videos of him in in researching this episode of him just like drawing characters when he was really young working at nintendo before he even went on to be a developer Mm -hmm. man what a talented dude honestly like great artist and then you have this kind of feel for game design virtually out of nowhere because there was no book on game design then right it was it was a bunch of blank pages for people to write on with the do's Mm -hmm. and don'ts and what a talented guy jeez man yeah must be must be recognized for sure um i did i did find you added this and i and i thought this was an interesting uh sort of tidbit the voice the the sort of digitized body blow voice uh was a man named don james who was a warehouse manager at nintendo of america now he's (laughs) the executive vice president um at ops uh of nintendo of america still but it's sort of crazy to think that the body blow guy is now like a high-ranking executive at nintendo it's amazing that makes me smile yeah absolutely yeah the uh the story goes that they just kind of had auditions Mm. at nintendo uh for who would do the voice yeah for who would do the voices for punch out and they ended up (laughs) they ended up picking the warehouse manager (laughs) see this is what i like is with nintendo it's always like, oh, you know, they they got some guy from the office to do the the knockout voice, and now he's like, you know, or the punch out voice, and now he's executive vice president. And with Turbo Graphics, is like, oh, they just got some dude to pose for the cover of Dungeon Explorer or something. <laughs> like, <laughs> no success story for that guy, but at Nintendo, it always seems to work out. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, one thing I did want to ask you, Paul, is I know you you didn't play this game until you were much older. You just said you saw it at a modern barcade. Were you like, were you any good at this game? Because I tried to play this game and I, for the love of me, could not sort of figure it out. Yeah, I, I like to think that I would have been better at it had I not been playing it like the NES, mm-hmm. like the home console versions of Punch-Out! Because again, they're just... They're just different enough to kind of mess up your timing. And more importantly, they mess up your expectations. You know, I'm just expecting the the opposing boxers to behave a certain way. And they're not. So, yeah, yeah, I was terrible at it. I played it a few times and I was like, all right, I'm going to go back to NBA Jam now. (laughs) Do you think also, because I sort of got this impression, having played Punch-Out on the NES or Super Punch-Out on the SNES beforehand sort of skewed my the way that I thought I could play this game because the subtlety of being directly behind your boxer as opposed to sort of tilted up with a much smaller sprite kind of played with my head as far as how the boxers were moving and when punches were coming and things like that. Did you feel that? Mm, I can't say that I did. I mean, if I did, it was subconsciously and I didn't Mm. notice. (laughs) But uh, no, I, I didn't necessarily have that issue. Sorry, dude. No, it's fine. I I just suck. Like I'm just trying to find excuses here <laughs> as to why I'm not good at, at arcade punch out. Um the the only other thing of note that I, you know, sort of saw in this game is that the the main character, the protagonist of the arcade game is not named Little Mac, which is another thing that I sort of took for granted. I I, I kind of assumed. I'm like, yeah, it's Little Mac. Of course it's Little Mac. It's always been Little Mac, but no. It's just this guy named Challenger. Um Yeah he didn't become little Mac until the Nintendo game, which I was honestly very surprised by. I don't know if everybody else just knew. And I was like the one, the odd man out on this one, but I I didn't know either. He was always little Mac. Um, I'm kind of glad that he wasn't little Mac because he looks unfortunate. This man is not, uh, (laughs) he's not an attractive protagonist. Like he's not working for Abercrombie and Fitch. Yeah. He has like disheveled green hair and you can tell that he's been (laughs) fighting for a while unsuccessfully because he's taken, he's got some lumps. I'll put it that way. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, I think with each of these games, the biggest part of the discussion is always going to be the fighters, the, the opponents that you fight along the way. They seem to always be front and center for every punch out game and they're the thing that i think people remember the most about each game um what i'll try to do the way i've organized this is to sort of talk about the characters as they appeared first so any unique from here on out any unique characters to those games are the ones that we're going to talk about but uh obviously the original punch out saw 
the introduction to a lot of our favorites. And where else to start, Paul, but with the iconic Frenchman, Glass Joseph. Um, <laughs> Glass Joe uh, is probably... I mean, he has to be the most well-remembered character because for the most part, he's probably the only one you saw um, or at least the only one you beat. Yeah. Like yeah. he's sort of a perennial loser um, who's just known as being like a weak and cowardly individual. Everybody just remembers his one in 99 record. It's um, it's so fantastic. Like you can his name lives on to this day. Like even with even if you're playing a completely unrelated video game. And there's like a super easy boss or like a tutorial boss or something. He's called Glass Joe. Yep. Right? Like people still use his name to refer to really <laughs> easy things in games. It's he's fantastic. I I always loved Glass Joe. Um, one because he made me feel confident before I got yes. completely destroyed. But two, because you have to admire the dedication of a man who you know, when he was one in 50, do you think he was ever like, maybe I should pack it in <laughs> before just going on to fight 50 more fights? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> basically a wrestling jobber. He was just there to yeah. put the better boxers over is what he was. Yeah, but I think he, especially in the arcade machine, I think he did, he played a very good role, which is making the player feel like this game was, you know, beatable. I think that yes. once you beat Glass Joe, you're like, all right, I, I kind of got this. And then you sort of get rocked by the other guys. But you feel like, well, I beat one guy. So maybe I try again. I can figure out how to beat the next guys. So I think yep. in that sense, he was sort of very important. I think if you would run into Bald Bull first out the gate, you would have been like, ah, I'm not playing this game anymore. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> um, and speaking of Bald Bull, he was sort of the next guy on, on the list. Uh from Istanbul, Turkey. Uh, he is known for being particularly difficult, I think, in every iteration of the game. So it's yes. interesting that he shows up this quickly in the arcade game because he's just as hard. Um, I don't think I don't think he shows up this early. I think the next opponent is it might be Piston Hurricane. I'm oh, you're have to right. Check this. You are right. I think you're right. Yeah. Um, um, and then Bald Bull and then right. etc. He's but, the third. Uh, yeah, dude. He's the third fighter. Yeah. Um, but bald bull man who like the the most hated i think consensus <laughs> opponent in punch out like i remember i remember as a kid just like the timing for the bull charge extremely yeah. difficult and then you just get the one shot knockout and you god i hated this fucking guy <laughs> <laughs> but how satisfying was it when you did nail that timing though Oh, that's 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 the whole point of like virtually every NES game is <laughs> that they were so hard that when you actually did get it, it was like, yes. <laughs> and then you move on to the next guy who just rocks your shit for like Absolutely. the next two hours. <laughs> um, Kid Quick was the next guy. He This is the only appearance of Kid Quick to my to my knowledge. He's only here uh, for the arcade version um, and he's the only boxer in this uh, version of the game to have a special attack. He's from Brooklyn, New York. So I think, uh, you know, I don't know if Ozzy would approve of Kid Quick. I think he... Uh... <laughs> but uh... And uh, and to be clear there, sorry, he's the only boxer in Punch-Out to not have a oh, special I'm sorry. attack. Yeah. God, I'm all over the place today. I'm glad you're here <laughs> to like, like everybody's going to come away from this being like, I know all this trivia about Punch-Out, but it's all wrong. I know not one correct <laughs> thing about Punch Out. <laughs> um, yeah, so Kid Quick, I I honestly don't have much to say about him. He was not I just because this was his only appearance. I don't think he really stands out sort of in the lore of Punch Out. No, no, he just stands out for being kind of a I don't know, kind of an ugly character. Like he's yeah. not he he's the one character design in this game where I'm like, Ugh. you know, he yeah. just doesn't just doesn't look good. Yeah, it doesn't it doesn't look good. Um, and I think, you know, we'll we'll sort of the the overtones are there, you know, like punch out characters are, are not known for their subtlety. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, they're uh, they're 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 pretty heavy on the stereotypes. Yeah, but we'll we'll get to that. When we, yeah, you we know, will. With, with each character. We'll talk about that. a little That's bit. right. Um, Mr. Sandman. Uh, this one I found interesting because I did not know this, but 
apparently it's believed that Mr. Sandman was sort of based off of boxing legend Joe Frazier. And once I knew that and I looked at them, I could definitely see it. I, I do think there is credibility to this. I would say so. I mean, even if the, <laughs> even if there isn't, like, it's still probable. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, yeah. it's, it's something that you can say and people will be like, oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, one thing I will note that on the Wikipedia for uh, Mr. Sandman, uh, it, it literally lists that he is known for not having a major stereotype. <laughs> that's that's the, that's sort of a quality of Mr. Sandman. Mr. Sandman also, for anybody who's who's played the NES game or the arcade machine, absolutely terrifying. Um, <laughs> yes. I was more scared of Mr. Sandman than I was of Bald Bull, to be honest with you. Even though they both just ended me, um, Mr. Sandman to me, he just seemed so much bigger than all the other sprites and just scarier. Yeah, like, he's a scary looking dude. When you when you play against him, I mean personally. I'd rather fight Sandman than Bald Bull, mm -hmm. but boy, Sandman, yeah. <laughs> uh, Piston Hurricane is a Cuban fighter. Uh, he makes his appearance here, um, and in uh, Super Punch Out, I believe, is his only other appearance. But I was so interested by this. He was replaced in the NES and Wii versions by Piston Honda, who, I mean, I, Piston Honda to me is like one of the iconic Punch Out characters. Yeah. Like, so it, I'm, I'm kind of sad that Piston Hurricane sort of never got his time to shine. Um, but, you know, Piston Honda, man, he's awesome. Hey, man, they got to have they got to have a Japanese fighter if they're releasing this game in Japan, right? Yeah, that's true. I didn't really think about it that way, but that is that's a fair point. Um, and then obviously we've arrived at everyone's favorite arcade punch out fighter, <laughs> Pizza Pasta. Um, <laughs> and, you know... If you can believe it, Paul, he is from Italy. Um, what? <laughs> yes, I know. Uh, he kind of, I don't, maybe I'm crazy. He kind of gives off like shades of Don Flamenco to me, like much, much wider and buffer. But like the hair, I think is kind of similar and the face shape. Yes, you could, you could be forgiven for thinking that Don Flamenco was originated from pizza pasta. From pizza pasta. <laughs> I mean, there's not much to say about Pizza Pasta other than the fact that Nintendo put out an arcade machine with a character named Pizza Pasta. Yeah, like I, I'm pretty sure I've got the origin story here. Do you want to do the origin story for this guy, Arnie? Oh, absolutely. So uh, this, this is this is how Pizza Pasta was invented. I'm I'm 100 percent certain of this. Here we go. So, Exterior Nintendo of Japan, uh, 1982. Yes, yes, and and you and I are employees. <laughs> That's right, Arnie. We need a name for that Italian fighter in our new video game. What makes you think of Italian people? Um, hmm. Uh, pizza? Pasta? Pizza pasta! That's our guy. Great job, Arnie. You're promoted. <laughs> That's the origin story of pizza pasta right yeah. there. That guy is now, like, head of marketing at Nintendo or something. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> He's, like, 1940s Prohibition era I know. guy, but... <laughs> It's the only that's, way that's to how be I see it. when you name your character Pizza Pasta. <laughs> yes. Oh, Lord. All right. So we're going to take a little break um, just to close out with Punch Out. I think what I want to ask you, Paul, is do you think this is an arcade machine that sort of holds up or has it sort of outlived its, its glory days? It holds up for novelty. Yeah. Nobody is nobody is going to take this game seriously. Mm -hmm. Like nobody's going to play it like they still play NBA Jam or yeah. TMNT or Street Fighter in its various iterations. But as a novelty at your modern barcade, absolutely Punch Out is a draw. Yeah. Yeah. I would I would agree with that. I think that Punch Out is one of those games in in the sort of NES era that got outshined by its home console port. I think that yeah. was, th there were times that that happened. Um, I Contra. don't think it was the norm. Yeah. Contra is the big example there, but yeah, when, when NES punch out came out, I think arcade punch out sort of became irrelevant right then and there, but yep. still sort of a nice piece of history to go back to in terms of the design and sort of the, the gameplay mechanics that are at play there. Um, yep. So with that, we're going to take a little break. We're going to come back at you with some more Punch-Out action with Super Punch-Out at the arcade. Look sharp and feel sharp. 
you. Choose the Razor, that is built for you. Light and regular and heavy. Hey, slick shades for any beard. Ole. And we're back. Ring that bell for round number two. Ding, ding, ding. Here we go. Super Punch Out Arcade. Um, obviously, naming was not Punch Out Strong Suit when you look at the home consoles <laughs> and the arcade versions. Um, but this one is only released in Japan and North America, Japan 84, North America 95. It still uses the vertically stacked monitors like the first game, and the gameplay for the most part remains largely unchanged. Um, the only thing that I found that was sort of noticeably different was that unlike the first game, you can pull the joystick straight up in order to have your character duck punches, which yes. seems to me like a recipe for a lot of arcade repair. Um, <laughs> if, if I'm thinking of myself, you're just yanking the crap out of that joystick. That's an entire episode. Arcade machines that are made to be destroyed. To be broken, yes. Because there are tons of those. <laughs> um, but I think, obviously, the most notable change with Super Punch-Out, as we discussed with Punch-Out Arcade, are the new characters. Whenever there's a new Punch-Out game, you're like, what What new and exciting uh, characters has Nintendo come up with me today? Um, and so for Super Punch-Out, we're going to start off with the one, the only, Canadian Bear Hugger. Yes. Um, I want to say, what do you think, Paul? Do you think he was one of the first sort of Canadian video game characters? Like, if by video game character you mean hero, <laughs> yes, he was national one of the first... icon. Yes, Canadian absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, probably. I mean, I it's not really something. I guess I'm not a very good Canadian. I haven't really researched the uh, you know video game characters. Mm -hmm. The thing is, we all just hang our hat on Wolverine and call it a day. Fair enough. Like, we Fair have enough. Wolverine, so it's like, anything else doesn't matter. Yeah, everything else is icing <laughs> on the cake. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but with uh, with Canadian Bear Hugger, yeah, he might be the very first prominent video game Canadian. Yeah. Um, I want to say, he. I found out that he hails from Salmon Arm, British Columbia. Is that a real place, or did they just yes, make this up? Yes, it is. Oh, it is. Okay. Good. I was, like, so... I was interested because I was, like, Salmon Arm. Like, I was, like, there's, like, a... 50% chance this is real and a 50% chance that some Japanese man like invented a town <laughs> in Canada. <laughs> yeah, no, salmon, salmon arm is out there. Perfect. Um I I like Bear Hugger. I think he's he's one of the I think what happens with Bear Hugger is that he's so different from every other sort of punch out fighter that he immediately stands out to me. As yes. like, you know, you've got your super, your super macho mans, you've got your sandmans, your, um, uh, you know, all your buff sort of really fit guys. And then it's just Canadian bear hugger and his overalls just trying to take your head off, man. Like, yep. he really, he really made an impact on me. Um, from there, we've also got Dragon Chan, um, who is a martial artist from Hong Kong. Um, this is, this is when I start getting a little, uh, concerned for the rules of boxing right like i think dragon chan sort of upends the traditional boxing spectrum since he can kick you and i am not allowed <laughs> yeah, to do the same how is that legal i was so angry when dragon <laughs> chan knocked me out with his flying kick i was like ref what is going yeah. on here? mario come on man yeah exactly man we're allowing this now i don't understand oh lord um, then you have Great Tiger from Mumbai, India. We'll get into him a little bit more with the, uh, NES game. Um, it, but I will say that it's interesting because when he first made his appearance in Super Punch Out, he's just a regular fighter. He's just a regular guy. But then when he comes back in the NES and Wii games, he starts developing all these magical powers. Again, the rules of boxing, people. This is the purity of boxing must be upheld here. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, man. I think you win any way you can. I think things weren't working out for Great Tiger just as a vanilla boxer. Fair enough. And uh, yeah, he just started developing magical powers to give him an edge. I don't see anything wrong with that. Ask I, Lance Armstrong. I... <laughs> Fair enough. Fair point. I'll give you that one. Touche, my friend. Um, I mean, I guess if they're not calling it, why not, right? Yeah. Um, 
And finally, we move on to the only man that I think could challenge for Pizza Pasta's crown of most <laughs> insane character name, Vodka Drunkinski, uh, who obviously hails from the USSR, um, who was later changed to Soda Popinski because Nintendo realized that they weren't going to get away with that one on the home console release for, for the children. It's amazing, man. Like, when you think of Nintendo's reputation today... <laughs> oh, <Lord>. vodka drunkensky <laughs> that's horrible <laughs> oh lord and and the thing is and i'll ask you because i've always had this question as soon as i found out about this i i had this question in my mind is that like were they so proud of the sort of drink last name in ski name scheme that they were just like we can't let this go we can't just name <laughs> him like vladimir or something we have to come up with a new sort of thing Soda Popinski, I got it. Like, is it that much of an improvement over Vodka <laughs> Drunkinski? It's it's so weird. It's so weird because like as here's the thing though, as kids we didn't we didn't care. Oh, like Soda Popinski, like, yeah, he loves soda pop. Yeah. Even though it really doesn't make any sense <laughs> at all. You know, like he likes soda. How does that even relate to boxing at all? You know, it's just it was so weird. It's the the choices made in these games are <laughs> questionable at best. <laughs> um, then we have we actually have a a sort of very well known five super macho man, um, super macho man again, just another terrifying fighter. The the I I'm starting to realize as we sort of go through these that the main emotion that I associate with Punch Out is fear. Yeah. <laughs> like there's no there's no joy in Punch Out. Like Punch Out is the game that I wake up in cold sweats in the middle of the night, like <laughs> after Mike Tyson's knocked me out for the seventy fifth time in a row. Yeah. Um but Super Macho Man was sort of known for in in a world of giant buff men, he was sort of the giantest buffest of them all. Yes. Um I found I managed to track down this old game fan cover. Um, that features Super Punch Out on the cover with Super Macho Man and your guy. And Super Macho Man looks like he was drawn by Rob Liefeld if he was on, like, <laughs> if he was, like, being his most Liefeld self. You know what I mean? Yes, like, the yes. tiniest feet, but the giantest neck and torso. Dude, he has, like, three sets of traps. <laughs> Like, there's, like, <laughs> anime lines on his anime lines on his muscles. That's how buff yeah. Super Macho Man was. <laughs> but I feel like this was, this was like, a thing that we really liked back in the day, is, like, make our sprites as insanely giant and buff as possible and make these, like, villains, like, as, like, crazy scary as you possibly can. Absolutely. Absolutely. That was, we'll get to the NES game, but that was one of the big appeals of the NES game. And uh, I got it. You know what? Before we actually go on to uh, <laughs> the next game here. Sorry, I'm looking at the outline and it's mm. going to be ridiculous. But I got to say, the description that we have here from Wikipedia of Bear Hugger <laughs> is basically me. <laughs> Fair enough. Did you, did you not notice this? Okay, so we'll take out the lumberjack part. So yeah. Bear Hugger personifies several stereotypes of Canadian people. Lumberjack, loves maple syrup, ice hockey, loves the wilderness. He wears overalls, is bald, <laughs> and has a thick brown beard and mustache and a tuft of chest hair. Dude, you take away Lumberjack and give me some overalls, and I'm Canadian Bear Hugger. I think we've just found the promo post for this, uh, for this episode on Instagram. It's you just in overalls holding a copy of Punch-Out. I'm going to have to. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to, because, oh, dude. I think we have a cosplay convention coming up here soon. Oh my god! Oh yeah! Yes, I'm gonna be I'm gonna be the guy that a nobody recognizes, and b this is just like a regular outfit up here. By the way, like I I actually saw I went to Alaska a few mm. years ago, and I went to a bar down there, and there was a dude wearing overalls, <laughs> no shirt. <laughs> And I was like, oh, my God, I am in Alaska. This is awesome. <laughs> Did you also notice that in the Wii version of Punch-Out, when you uh, when Bear Hugger has to defend, when you win the title and you have to defend it against Bear Hugger, he gets a knit cap as well? Yeah, yeah, very Canadian. I, I love the, <laughs> oh, man, do I ever love that game? But we'll, we'll get to that game later. Yeah. 
<laughs> we will. We will. Um, the other thing that we need to talk about, and I will not allow us to to leave Super Punch Out until we do, is the fact that there was an unlicensed bootleg version of Super Punch Out called yes. Frank Bruno's Boxing. I had I'd never heard of this before. Had you had did, were you aware of this? Nope. Okay. No idea. <laughs> so it was released exclusively in Europe, which kind of makes sense because the Super Punch Out Arcade never made it over there. Um, yeah. On December thirty first of nineteen eighty five, so it, re- it was released for the C sixty four, Commodore sixty four, the ZX Spectrum. So Jeff doesn't get mad at me, um, and the Amstrad <laughs> CPC. So all these sort of you know extremely European computer consoles. Um, yes. And then in 1986, it got released on the Commodore 16 and the Commodore Plus 4. Um, basically, it replaces Little Mac with Frank Bruno, the English boxer. Um, it only includes the first three fighters. So it, it's only Bear Hugger, who's been renamed to Canadian Crusher. Dragon Chan, who has been renamed to Fling Long Chop. Amazing. Because apparently- I don't like, you know, they, they were like, you know what? Not racist enough. But you know, this is what I, this is what I really, I just want to be in like a pitch meeting for one of these things because <laughs> they're in the, in the infinite space of names, right? That you could name any character. Why would you look at Dragon Chan and think that Fling Long Flop is, is like, or Fling Long Chop is the like obvious next step in evolution? <laughs> it's me. He doesn't even chop. And then, and then in a, in a, I guess, sort of more, like a, a more improved name, Vodka Drunkinski became Andra Punch, Puncheradov. I can't yeah. even say that name correctly. Yeah, it's weird. It's like, it's like at the meeting, they were like, all right, fling long chop. And then, boy, we really got to fix this Russian. Though. Yeah, this we got to, we got to do something about Vodka Drunkinski. This is super racist that's, that's not, that's not okay. <laughs> um, but wait, Paul, because we haven't even gotten to the exclusive fighters. Because there are five unique fighters. Tribal Trouble, Frenchy France, which up there with pizza pasta, my dude. Like, yeah, yeah. Honestly, lazier than pizza pasta. I'm saying Frenchy France is is the worst. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's the worst one. (laughs) Yeah, it's so lazy. Raviolo Mafiosi. (laughs) (laughs) Sorry. It's like they, it's like they're like, what do we need? Spaghetti salami, you know, like just like any kind of two alliter or you know, like it's not even alliterative actually. It's <laughs> Ravi Raviolo. He's like, just make sure Sorry. it ends in a vowel. It's got to end in a vowel, otherwise it's not Italian. There you go. Yep. Uh, Antipodine Andy. That's as as good as I think I can I can say that name. Better than I could. And uh, by pe- the way, did you did you look up what anti or and I, I'm going to pronounce it the way you did because yeah. it's way better than the way I was going to. <laughs> did you did you look up what Antipodean means? I did not actually. Do you know what it means? No. Okay, because you know why? Because nobody does. I don't know how they settled on Antipodean. <laughs> they just Andy. made up a word. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's it's a word used by people in the northern hemisphere to refer to Australians and New Zealanders. They're they're Antipodeans. What? I know. What? <laughs> Oh god. <laughs> and like that I guess it's a super common word in England. I don't know. <laughs> Jesus, man. <laughs> and then obviously Peter Perfect, who I can only assume sure. is British or something. Oh, you have to assume. As yeah. as as perfect as he is. Um what I what I do like is that this game was then re-released in 1989 to coincide with Frank Bruno's big fight with Mike Tyson. Oh god, it's so it's so poetic. It really is because Mike Tyson's punch out on the NES was a million times better than this game. <laughs> like if you look at this game and so much like in real life where Mike Tyson beat the crap out of a very I don't want to be here Frank Bruno. <laughs> <laughs> that's what happened with this game as well. Oh lord. What do you what what are the odds, do you think, that in, like, five or ten years, this is, like, a $500 game or something? Well, after this podcast, it's... <laughs> Climbing 100%. rapidly. Please, snatch up those copies of Frank Bruno's Boxing. What was the, uh, was it Evander Holyfield on the Master System that's, like, like insanely expensive? 
James Buster Douglas. That's right, James Buster Douglas, who is famous for beating Mike Tyson. Yeah. It all it all comes together, Paul. It's it's a giant circle of these boxing games that all center around Mike Tyson. (laughs) All right. So with that, we're gonna close out. Super punch out. The arcade games are done. It's time to get into what everybody I would assume is here for. The real meat and potatoes of punch out. We're talking NES punch out or Mike Tyson's punch out. Um, you know, it's, I want to say in the, in the time when like retro games were coming up and were sort of blowing up, you know, the early two thousands when the whole YouTube thing was getting going, I always felt like punch out was known for being that really hard game. Like Mike Tyson was sort of, if you wanted to prove your gamer cred, you had to beat Mike Tyson and punch out. Like that was yep. the that was the go to. How good of a gamer are you? How how much work are you willing to put in to be to be respected by your peers? He was so difficult that you can't even like, you know, when you're like, okay, we're talking about gamer cred, right? Yeah. Nobody ever asked you, well, have you beat Mike Tyson <laughs> in order to prove your cred? It was more like. Oh yeah, I beat Mike Tyson, and then everybody's like, "Whoa!" Yeah, like he was so difficult. Nobody ever even thought to ask the question: <laughs> "Have you ever beat Mike Tyson?" It was assumed you didn't. Yeah, it was assumed that you tried and you failed miserably. Absolutely. Um. So this one uh was actually released in Japan in uh, September of eighty seven, but that was the promotional gold cartridge. So before they got the Mike Mike Tyson license, I believe. Nintendo sort of did a contest uh, with their arcade game Golden. Was it Golden T? Um, let me look this no, up. No, they had they had an NES Open Golf. Oh, that's right. It was NES Open yeah. Tournament Golf, where they gave out ten thousand copies of uh, Punch Out, this beautiful gold cartridge uh, featuring uh, Paul's favorite boxer, Bald Bull, looking <laughs> menacingly at you from the cover. Um, Amazing that they chose him, the ugliest fighter possible. <laughs> <laughs> this was it, it was sort of i guess the initial sort of print run and it apparently did it incredibly well people loved it um when it first came out and i have to wonder if nintendo maybe was a little bit worried that the sort of popularity of punch out the arcade machine would not translate as well into home consoles yeah yeah they they were there was some concern there about that because the arcade controls and the whole the whole like premise of it is mm-hmm. extremely simple. Uh, and you can see that they added some things in the NES version. They added far more fighters. The uh, the gameplay itself is a little bit different. It has like a, a rhythm slash puzzle aspect to it. Yep. You know, you have to kind of figure out how to beat King Hippo and you have to figure out how to block Great Tiger. So there's a little bit more there and uh, and storyline with Little Mac and yep. Doc Lewis, which right. was not in the arcade at all. Yep. Um, so then in October, we got North America, baby. Number one, we got Mike Tyson's punch out before Japan or Europe. Um, Japan got it shortly after us. Europe, obviously, bringing up the rear as per usual. Those Pretty dang. quick, though. Like yeah. it, it was less than a two month turnaround yeah. for Pal. It was like we got it in October. They had it by December. So they didn't yeah. have to wait that long for it. Um, and then obviously, uh, North America and Europe later got punch out which was the non mike tyson version uh with was it mr dream was the uh final boss in that one yeah um so in addition to takeda directing um and wada doing the art for this as i think he may have done before um i think he he worked with miyamoto to do some small things he, uh, he did he did the designs for the new characters That's right. in Super Punch Out. Yeah. And uh and pretty much all the characters going forward. Yeah. Um Minoru Arakawa uh was a producer on the game. Arakawa was sort of the founder and former president of Nintendo of America. If you're talking about Nintendo of America and sort of Nintendo's ex- in, in incursion into the North American territory, Arakawa is sort of the the A number 1 guy. Absolutely. Um so obviously I need to mention that uh finally with the NES game we get Little Mac. I love Little Mac. Little Mac is <laughs> arguably one of my favorite video game characters because as a as a vertically challenged man myself, 
I really admire Little Mac for beating up people who are much larger than he is. Um, yep. Something that I was never able to successfully do. <laughs> um, Every kid, man. Every kid loved Little Mac, as far as I could tell. Yeah. Although his, I gotta say, though, his quotes are hilarious. <laughs> he, poor Little Mac does not have one positive thing to say. I actually, I he looked sure it doesn't. up, like, he says, he says four different things in mike tyson's punch out and he has a couple of extra things just for the king hippo fight because the king hippo fight is, is very special yeah his four things are i'm tired doc he's hurt me doc <laughs> i can't win doc <laughs> and help doc <laughs> <laughs> little mac ladies and gentlemen <laughs> you're your beautiful hero only 17 years old apparently <laughs> and he's know, out here right? fighting grown men <laughs> And, fucking child abuse and half hippo people apparently <laughs> um obviously uh you know knowing that the nes wasn't as powerful as an arcade machine we've discussed this before they sort of for they sort of forewent the wireframe of the previous games and instead made little mac a very small sprite as compared to his very large opponents um basically so you could see what was going on you know they sort of had to make it so you could see what your opponents were going to be doing Yes. Um I I love that he was originally going to be named Peter Punch. Um <laughs> there's a small part of me that wishes that I lived in the alternate universe where he is Peter Punch. Um just because I I don't know. I like alliteration. I'm a sucker for that sort of stuff. Oh, who isn't? Um and uh as Pizza as pasta, Anthony, man. as Anthony would say, he is from the Bronx or the Bronx, <laughs> New York. Um what do you so Paul I I wanted to ask you I know that you mentioned that people seem to like Little Mac but you know in a game like Punch-Out where everything is so character driven and characters are so important do you think that Little Mac sort of got outshined by all the other like the opponents that he was facing You know that's that's a tough question to answer like yes Yes, he got outshined because mm -hmm. nobody talks about Little Mac when they talk about Mike Tyson's punch out. They talk about King Hippo. They talk about Bald Bull. Yeah. They, they talk about, <laughs> God help me, Soda Popinski. Yeah. And obviously, they talk about Mike Tyson. Yeah. So, yes, he was overshadowed, but like, I do kind of think that was by design. Yeah. You know what I mean? Little Mac is really just kind of an avatar for the player themselves. Mm -hmm. Because at this time, like, it's mostly kids playing their Famicoms and their NESs and and you're kind of projecting yourself onto Little Mac I'm yeah. assuming is what they intended so yeah he's he's kind of meant to be outshined by the other more colorful boxers but that's not a bad thing yeah I don't think it's a bad thing at all um I do think he sort of got a second chance at life with Super Smash Brothers I think I was very surprised that he became a fighter there I was not expecting that yeah no kidding I mean when you look at the roster now it's not terribly surprising yeah but it was set first. I'm like, oh, it was sweet, Little Mac. <laughs> That's right. Um, I will say that one of the things that I've always noticed about Punch Out, and one of the things that that always stood out to me was this game has what I would argue is some of the most expressive sprites in an NES game. Like whenever you hit some of these characters, they make all these faces. You see them like wince in pain as they fall backwards and things like that and that just adds like a little bit of color uh to a game that obviously i think would be far less exciting without it dude you we take it for granted now but compare mike tyson's punch out to virtually every other game on the nes there is nothing even remotely close, especially at that time. What was it, 1987? Mm -hmm. There is nothing even remotely close to it in terms of the size of the sprites and their expressiveness. It's a completely unique situation for that game. And I, I think it's one of the huge reasons for its popularity. Like, the sprites alone, there was never any sprite on the NES that big. Yeah. And to be fair, that's because they, Genyo Takeda they, and his team, they specifically developed a chip to put on the cartridge to increase its memory. It was the, the MMC2 chip. That's right. And so with that memory, they were able to create these giant sprites. So, you know, when, when I say there is nothing else like that on the NES, there is a reason. It's because it was physically impossible. Mm -hmm. Puncho was, like, ahead of its time, really. Yeah. And 
I think it it adds sort of what we've been talking about before. You know, you hate a lot of these characters like Bald Bull, but when you punch that guy when he's doing his bull charge and he sort of goes into his sort of frozen sprite and then backs up and falls, you know, face first oh, into the canvas. So good. You're like, fuck you, dude. Like, I'm awesome. <laughs> <laughs> um I I did want to mention uh Arakawa's sort of hand in what would become Mike Tyson's punch out. He didn't have a hand in developing any of the game, but he's sort of the guy. He attended a boxing match that featured Mike Tyson, and he was so blown away by Mike Tyson, who in 90, who in 87 or I guess this might have been even as early as 86 was not world heavyweight champion at that point. He was just coming up through the ranks. Yeah. Um but it was sort of a, a moment where he was so impressed by him that he was like, I want to license this man for our boxing game. And that was man, a risk at the time. It was it was a risk. It wasn't a huge risk because at that time that Arakawa saw him, I think, I don't know if he was at the match. I think he actually saw him at a bar, mm-hmm. like on TV or something. But anyway, these are, these are stories lost to history, yeah. really. But like, here's the thing. When Mike Tyson turned pro... I think he had 19 fights in one year. Yeah. And the reason he had 19 fights in one year was because he was destroying <laughs> everyone. By the end of that first year, there was no doubt that this guy was going to be heavyweight champ eventually. Yeah. It, was, it was just a matter of time. So, like, on one hand, Arakawa sees him in a match. And, yeah, it's a risk because he's not the champion. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, dude, Tyson, I can't... I, I I wish you were alive at that time, Arnie. I actually don't because I I, I wish I was younger like you. But <laughs> but to experience Mike Tyson during that era mm. was to see a boxer so scary, such a headhunter. Like he was so impressive, and he was the most popular athlete in the world for a time. I would say yeah. until Michael Jordan. Sorry, yeah. until Michael Jordan kind of came over and, and took over pop culture. The Mike, but Mike Tyson was the man. And to anybody who saw him, even before he came champ, yeah, it was, you could you could see the writing on the wall there. Yeah, I, like you said, I sort of grew up a post-Tyson, but, you know, watching Mike Tyson, like, highlight knockout videos of Mike Tyson were a thing that I definitely watched in high school. All his first round knockouts, just knocking people yeah. out of the ring and like oh my God, crazy stuff. I mean, the guy looked like a monster. So there's a there's a documentary called Tyson mm. where they have footage of him training at 17 years old. He is so fast <laughs> for his size. I thought that they were like fast forwarding the video. Like, yeah. I couldn't believe it. Yeah, he he was he was unbelievable. Yeah, and so. With that, Mike Tyson became the first Nintendo endorsed video game celebrity, you know, like it was it was crazy. I I did want to ask you, Paul. Well, two things. One is I wanted to ask you about your experience sort of playing Mike Tyson's punch out since I know you were a fan of boxing at the time. But I also wanted to ask you, like, when you saw Mike Tyson on the cover of a Nintendo game, did it sort of feel like worlds were colliding? Like, were you like? What what is this? Like where am I right now that a celebrity is on the cover of my, you know, sort of NES game? I know it it became I know it became much more commonplace later on, but in this yeah. in this early time, what what was that like? I was too young, dude. Okay. I was I was too young to really grasp any kind of significance for that, mm. unfortunately. But uh yeah, if you ask me if I played Punch Out? Yeah. I mean like, did I breathe air? Did I drink water? <laughs> like of course I played Punch Out. And man, it wasn't just me. Like everybody played Punch Out, and everybody loved Punch Out. Mm-hmm. And I gotta tell you, like I, I did beat Mike Tyson. <laughs> oh wow, really? I did. Yeah, that's there. There's my cred. In fact, I beat Mike Tyson. When I was a kid. I got really, really good at the game, mm-hmm. right? And later on, I think somewhere between the ages of eighteen and twenty-one. I don't remember. I've mentioned this on Instagram before, but yeah. I'll tell the story here because. It's hilarious, I think, anyway. <laughs> so between somewhere between like 18 and 21, I'm at my buddy Nuno's house. By the way, best, dude, best name. His name was Nuno Nunes. <laughs> and we used to, when we were in high school, 
<laughs> like I was in his class and we had a supply teacher. Yeah. And the supply teacher was just kind of like writing down everyone's name uh, to take roll call, right? At the beginning of class. And he goes to Nuno and he says, <laughs> what's your name? And he says, Nuno Nunes. And the supply teacher's like, okay, like, what do you think? I'm stupid. What's, <laughs> what's your name? <laughs> and he's like, it's, it's Nuno Nunes. He's like, come on. And the rest of us are like, no, no, it's, it's Nuno Nunes. And the supply teacher was like, that's it, get up, go to the office, go, to the, go see the principal. <laughs> that's the Key and Peel sketch come to life. <laughs> it really is. So yeah, I met, I met my buddy Nuno's house, and he has his NES, and uh, you know, we're, this is way past the NES, like we're into PlayStation now, but he's still oh, got wow. his NES yeah. hooked up, and he's got Punch Out, I'm like, let's play Punch Out, right? And so I loaded it up, and starting from Glass Joe, I went... 14 and 0. Wow. I beat Mike Tyson and I beat him in the first round Ooh. by TKO. Which I'm not even I'm not even going to lie. It's extremely difficult. Oh, you have to like really is. kind But the muscle memory, it was all there. That's how much I played Puncho when I was a kid. It was all there. So, fast forward now 10 years later. Yeah. Me and Nuno were we're at a, we're at a friend's wedding, right? Mm. And this is when I just started dating Christy. She would, she would later become my wife. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we're standing around in a circle, the guys and some of the girls are hanging out. And of course, because we're at a friend's wedding, we're talking about video games. Mm -hmm. And so I say to Nuno, I'm like, hey, man, remember that time I was at your house and I beat Mike Tyson in the first round? <laughs> and Nuno looks at me and he's like, no. I'm like, what do you mean? No. Damn. That, Blowing up that, your spot. I'm like, this, this is a thing. I'm like, I'm a video game god. How can you possibly be <laughs> disputing this? And he's like, dude, that never happened. And he says, you know how I know that never happened? Because it's impossible. <laughs> Nobody can beat Mike Tyson in the first round. What are you even talking about? <laughs> and I look over at my girlfriend and I'm like, I can't argue with this guy over a 20-year-old video game. <laughs> This won't be a good look for me. Just shut down so, the whole wedding. Excuse me, everybody. <laughs> so I just had to eat it up. I was like, yeah, maybe I'm wrong. But I wasn't wrong. <laughs> I beat that fucker in the first round. Also, it's possible. I looked it up on YouTube. I've seen guys do it. <laughs> Very difficult, but definitely possible. So you've been waiting all these years to get a public platform to do a Mike Tyson punch out related episode. Also, you can call out Nuno. This and to trash Pokemon, which I've already done. <laughs> so now I can retire from the Region Free exactly. Gamers podcast. <laughs> Last appearance. <laughs> all dreams accomplished. Drop the mic. Drop the boxing gloves. I'm good. <laughs> so, so let me ask you this. Since I do believe that you've done it, do you think you could still do it? Like, do you think you could still be Tyson? Uh, Yes. I don't know if I'd be able to do it in the first yeah. round, and I don't know that I'd be able to do it on my first try okay. like I did that day. It, it's The timing for that first 90 seconds is really twitchy, yeah. really, really twitchy. And as I mentioned earlier, I am old now. So, you know, with, with a few tries, maybe more than a few, yeah, I could, I could definitely do it, but it would it would not be easy yeah well it's it's sort of what you're talking about right that punch out eventually comes down to sort of pattern memorization and muscle memory or twitch sort of twitch reflex um and i will say like i think the best the best sort of example of this was um <laughs> it was revealed in an interview by uh wada uh sorry i'm blanking on his on the first name would you happen to know <laughs> i can't remember i think oh. it's makoto Oh, okay. Makoto Wada revealed later on um, in an interview, I want to say like 22 years after the game came out, um, that the the way for you to sort of figure out how to stop Bald Bull's bull charge is by looking for a camera flash in the crowd as he's doing it, which yep. is so insane that yep. I can't <laughs> even imagine that like as a child, if I had seen that, I don't think I would have even put it together. I would have been like, Oh yeah, it's just the cycle of the sprites in the crowd just doing their thing. Like, well, dude, nobody did. <laughs> like it took, it took Wada 22 game or sorry, 22 years after the game's release to say, Hey, just look for the guy flashing his bulb in the crowd. Nobody figured it out. Jesus man. It's, 
uh, the the like the sadistic things that these developers did to children in the NES era. <laughs> Honestly. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, some could view it as a, a potential helping hand, but <laughs> I can definitely see why you think it was sadistic. <laughs> the funny thing is is that in that interview, Wada actually alluded to the fact that there may be more little helpful hints oh and God. Easter eggs in the game that people hadn't yet discovered. Yeah. And uh, sure enough, seven years later, um, some guy, he doesn't even have a real name. He's just like a Reddit user. He discovered that during the second Bald Bull and Piston Honda fights, you'll see a bald, bearded man. Uh, actually, no, he's not bald. He's just a bearded man in the crowd. I was thinking he might be Bear Hugger, but he's just a bearded guy <laughs> in the crowd. Possibly Paul Romalo himself. Possibly, yes, wearing a wig, which I often do, to hide my shame. <laughs> when you see the bearded man duck in the crowd, that's when you throw your punch, and you'll knock them out, period, every time. If you throw your punch, when the bearded guy ducks. Which I like that that implies, not only that you've made it this far, but that you're comfortable enough to look away from two of the <laughs> fastest and most terrifying video game opponents in history. Like, oh, do you think goodness. I'm going to take time to look away from Bald Bull as he's charging at me? Like, I'm not insane. I, I certainly wouldn't. I certainly <laughs> wouldn't. But let me tell you, though, man, have you seen the people speedrunning this game blindfolded? I was just watching it today, yes. <laughs> Oh my god, I had no idea, no idea until we were researching this episode that yeah. people were doing this. Certainly, like, my my little story about how I beat Mike Tyson in one round, please, that's nothing. That's nothing. <laughs> those These guys people, are playing this game blindfolded. I think those people have a disease uh, similar <laughs> to people who decide to play, like, Dark Souls with, like, the Donkey Konga controllers or the Guitar Hero guitar. Like, yeah, yeah. Truly, completely unnecessary just just my desire to punish myself to achieve i guess higher high, a higher being like do you arrive at a higher plane um when you <laughs> beat mike tyson blindfolded i guess you enter into the state of nirvana yeah, that you, not even the best drugs can get you to you're the upper echelon of, that's when the dmt like sort of hits and you're like this is it i've arrived <laughs> Oh, Lord. I just, I think that secretly it's just that I'm jealous. I'm just very envious of people who of have, course. who are able to, to do I am these too. things. I'm um, sure, I'm sure of two things. I'm sure that overall, broad strokes, yeah. my life is more fulfilling than theirs. <laughs> and I'm also very jealous of them. Yes. Those two <laughs> things are simultaneously true. <laughs> yes. Um, in terms of fighters, uh, the NES sort of saw a lot of fan favorites, obviously, because I think the NES is inarguably the peak of the series, I would argue, with with the Wii game sort of contending for that crown. No, you're you're right. The NES game is the peak of the series. Yeah. There there can be no debate, really. Yeah. Um so we see a lot of a lot of favorites like Von Kaiser, um, who I don't know if you could tell was German. Uh Piston Honda, who we've already talked about replacing Piston Hurricane. Um you know, Piston Honda, I, I grabbed a screen grab from one of the interstitials between rounds because each of these boxers sort of have quotes and a lot of them are just very vaguely threatening, like I'm going to destroy you or whatever. And Piston Honda's is just like sushi, kamikaze, Fujiyama, I know. Fujiyama. Nippon Ichi. <laughs> and I'm just like, you got to give it to Nintendo for just being across the board, like being very even handed <laughs> with the, with the stereotypes and racism. I know. <laughs> like no, no, no one is spared. Not even Piston Honda. Nope. Uh, then you get to arguably, I will say this is a spoiler for later, but my favorite f punch out fighter, Don Flamenco. <laughs> I he's the most hateable man. He is the most punchable character in punch out, I would say. Other yes. than Glass Joe, maybe. Don Flamenco is just this, like, preening, narcissistic Spaniard um, who holds a rose in his mouth and comes out to the fight of the Matador, or the March of the Toreadors, I'm I'm sorry. Um, just designed to piss you off. Even in the Wii yep. game, he's even worse. He's He is worse in the Wii game. He made me very upset. <laughs> in, uh, in this one, though, in Mike Tyson's Punch-Out, he's, he's so punchable and also like really easy yeah it like and when you punch him he has like this 
really wide mouth surprised look. Yep. Oh man, what a satisfying guy to beat. <laughs> um and King Hippo, uh I would say other than Little Mac probably the default the defaulto like the default mascot of the series kind of like he's the only one that made it onto Captain N the game master. That's what I'll say. <laughs> Which is amazing. <laughs> I love when we do these episodes. We in we invariably end up watching old cartoons yeah. related to the games we're talking about, <laughs> and they're always like terrible, or they have something terrible about them. Oh, just oh just man, the best. Um, and then obviously, Great Tiger, Ball Bull, Soda Popinski, Mister Sandman, Super Macho Man, culminating in Mike freaking Tyson, Kid Dynamite, as they called him. Just yep. insanely difficult, like like we've discussed. The first 90 seconds, I don't think you are allowed to get hit, or you will just be knocked out immediately. Correct, yeah. The first 96, or sorry, the first 90 seconds, he throws dynamite punches, yeah. and if you get touched, you go down. Oh, Lord. Um, As we've discussed, sort of, Tyson got paid in a limited capacity to be uh the face of the game so it was a three-year contract once that ended uh nintendo chose not to renew understandable since it was what 90 91 like the the nes was on its way out there was no reason to renew for mike tyson but it's i don't i think it's it's fair to say that without mike tyson punch out i don't think does as well as it did i think it's still a great game i think it it still is a a very strong seller but I think that the appeal of Mike Tyson sort of drew in a lot more people to to punch out. I agree. Yeah, it would have been popular. It's a great game just by itself. But when you put Mike Tyson on the cover and you have him sort of as this unbeatable boss character, mm -hmm. it adds that just that extra level of mystique. Again, it can't be overstated what a huge, huge athlete Mike Tyson was at the time. Yeah. Like everybody knew who Mike Tyson was. Yep. Um, and so with that, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to close out this section. We're going to take a little break. We're going to come back and wrap this up with Super Punch-Out! and We Punch-Out!! So stay tuned for that. Welcome back, folks. Uh, round number three. Final round. Ding, ding, everybody. Let's go. Let's finish it up. Super Punch-Out, Paul. On the Super Nintendo, of course. Where else could you see Super Punch-Out? Um, Indeed. Released in North America, 94. Uh, Europe and North America both got this game uh, before Japan. Europe got it in 95. And then Japan got it only as part of a Nintendo Power Flash RAM cartridge. So it was basically in Japan, you could buy these blank cartridges that I think could hold up to maybe six or eight games. You would go to a shop, you'd pay money for the RAM, for the ROM that you wanted. You'd They'd insert the cart and they'd flash burn it onto the cart for you. So that was the yep. only way you could play Super Punch-Out in Japan. Uh, that's insane. I, I, I'm honestly, I'm always very surprised when these Japanese video game series don't end up in Japan for one reason or another, you know? Yeah. Um, I'd have to imagine that maybe Punch-Out! just didn't do as well out there um, as it did, you know, in the States and in and in the PAL territories. But Perhaps. I, I have no way to prove that. Um, once again, features Little Mac, though he looks extremely different. Um, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> he, that's not Little Mac. Let's 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 be real. Well, it's <laughs> it's like this weird blonde haired spike. I don't know, man. That's that's not little Mac. Yeah. What I'm saying, he doesn't look like an underdog. Well, this guy, he just looks like some blonde haired punk. Yeah, he kind of looks like a douchebag. Um, yeah. But I will say Bryce Holiday, one of the main developers for the Wii version of Punch-Out, does agree with you. He basically says that the character in Super Punch-Out is not Little Mac. Um, but, I mean, a few people have disagreed with him. Uh, Nintendo of America, for one. I don't know if they're an expert or anything, but uh, they Nintendo claim... baffles me. They... they baffle me. Why are they so, like... Because Nintendo denies any kind of relationship between Star Fox and F-Zero, even though we've outlined... 
in the F Zero episode, which was so much fun, by the way. Yeah. Even though we outlined all the like kind of familial mm-hmm. connections between Star Fox and F Zero, Nintendo's like, no. Yeah. And then they take this blonde, spiky haired <laughs> dude who's relatively huge and say, yeah, that's little Mac. <laughs> no. No, guys, stop. It. Just stop. I think Nintendo. I don't know. I think they have they with specific franchises because they did this with Zelda too. Remember when the Zelda timeline came out? You remember that whole that <laughs> yeah. that it, oh just the the insanity that happened when that when that finally came out. Nintendo has this desire to make their games sort of fit a nice convenient narrative even though their developers are like under no such pretense. Like they're like, "Oh, none of this has to be connected, right?" And then 20 years later they're like, well, how do we explain all these things? <laughs> it's like I've got it. We'll make fifty different timelines. Perfect. <laughs> they don't even they don't even try to explain Mario being the ref oh, in Mike Tyson's you know? punch out. <laughs> that was just like Makoto Wada was like, Yeah, I'm just gonna throw Mario yeah, in here. I'm just gonna And Nintendo didn't even say anything. It's fine, don't worry about it. He has a lot of side gigs. He's a real he's yeah. a real hustler, that one. <laughs> <laughs> That's how he funds his extravagant lifestyle of running around castles and stuff. I mean, that's a vacation, right? Fair enough, yeah. In Sunshine, it definitely was. And then some guy was like, you're going to clean this mess up. <laughs> no breaks for, for Mario, man. Um, they N- Nintendo of America's stance is pretty much like, it is Little Mac. This just happens like after the NES and Wii games, which hear me out. Here's my thought. What if... He became champion, right? And he let the fame get to his head, Paul. So he starts, you know, like he starts doing steroids because he needs to stay at the top of the game. You know, he can't he can't sort of fall now. He's he's worked so hard to make it to make it here. Doc Lewis has abandoned him. He doesn't care. He dyes his hair um, sort of in a in a depression filled (laughs) drug fueled rage escapade. And now he's back trying to reclaim what is rightfully his. Your your storyline is completely plausible <laughs> also terrible <laughs> because now what... i'm controlling a guy that why would i want to control this guy See, what i just described to you would have been like if there was a punch out remake for like ps3 by like yes some american yes, that's what it would have been <laughs> that's what it would have been little max down on his luck his wife's left him he's an alcoholic yeah, <laughs> yeah that's that's a 2005 game for sure <laughs> um so uh, Charles Martinet of Mario fame, speaking of Mario, because we just make these connections and we forget, uh, is credited <laughs> with voicing all the fighters, the referee, and the announcer for Super Punch-Out, which yep. I did not know this again. Like, I learned so much researching Punch-Out. Um, yeah. But that's awesome. Like, I, I love that. <laughs> I love that factoid. Yeah, me too. Um, so, your opponents here. New guys. Gabby J. So, Gabby J., I I have an interesting perception of because he was trained by Glass Joe. And so and so immediately I have questions. My first question is when you were being trained by Glass Joe and you saw him fight, what was the motivation to continue to be trained by Glass Joe at that point? The only thing I can think of is that literally nobody else out of the six billion people on planet Earth wanted to train him. Fair enough. That is that is a fair point. And one of my favorite sort of lore, like sort of speculative lore, is that Gabby J, much like Glass Joe, also has a 1 in 99 record. But it's speculated that his only win is against Glass Joe. <laughs> which is amazing. I love that. I love that I so much. Um, But... Other than that, Gabby J is just the Glass Joe of Super Punch Out. Um, I don't think I don't think he really stands out as a character that much. He's just the first guy you fight that you have to get through. Um, then we get Bear Hugger in his inaugural console debut. So the Canadian menace did make that transition successfully. I would say. Um, yeah, I'd say so too. Very fun like fighter. A gigantic sprite in the game. Very visually impressive for yes. the time. Um, Piston Hurricane, Bald Bull. Bob Charlie. Bob Charlie. Oh, Bob Charlie. Oh, Bob Charlie. What was... <laughs> I saw you posted a Bob Charlie quote because I think before you fight, they all have these... Um, they all they all have these little sayings. And Bob Charlie's is something to the effect of like, those who do not feel the rhythm are lost. 
do you feel the rhythm? <laughs> yeah. And I was like, yes, I don't know. But I mean, <laughs> just in case you didn't realize it offhand, uh, Bob Charlie is a reference to Bob Marley. He is from Kingston, Jamaica. I, you know, was he particularly difficult to fight? I don't, I, like, a lot of the super punch-out, care, like, opponents, I'm struggling to sort of place if there was anything that stood out about them, like, as opposed to some of the NES ones that we remember so fondly. You know, Bob, Bob Charlie was actually fairly vanilla. His, his only kind of difference from other fighters mm-hmm. is that he would actually do fakes, uh, so where up where other opponents would crouch down and then follow up with an uppercut, mm-hmm. Bob Charlie crouches down and then stands up again. Ah, uh, I see. And then punches. So it's just meant to fake you out. It's uh it's a nice little twist. He's not that difficult though, mm-hmm. but yeah, it's it's a little twist. Okay. Um, you know, Dragon Chan makes his console debut as well. A lot of a lot of crossover with Super Punch Out Arcade and Super Punch Out console, which you would expect. Um, and then we get to Masked Muscle, and I actually really like Masked Muscle because of his gimmick, which is that he yeah. cheats. He cheats during his fight. He will headbutt you. He will spit at you, which I think does block your view of the fight, if I'm not mistaken. But I could be wrong about that. Do you remember? It, it reduces your view. That's right. Uh, you you just you can't punch back. So he'll ah, do like a he'll do a series of five different attacks, and you can't fight back, but you can still dodge. And his he turns into sort of like not a wireframe but like a cloudy fighter. Okay, but you can you can figure out what he's doing. Yeah. Um. And so what what I like about him is that one I love his design. I love that he's a luchador turned boxer, which he was banned from wrestling for using <laughs> illegal maneuvers. And in the punch out world, no, I'm I'm quite livid actually. The more I think about this. They are. They accuse him of cheating. No other character is is sort of labeled as a cheater. Meanwhile, Dragon Chan is like jumping off ropes and kicking you in the face, and like Great Tiger or some of these people are using like magical powers to like disappear. Yeah. But Mast Muscle is the cheater here. Uh, yeah, I know. I know. It, he just he spits in your face. I'm and uh, and that's the cheating. I will not stand for this. <laughs> For this libelous uh, reinterpretation of mass muscle, he deserves to be included. Not known for cons- for consistency. Definitely not. Um, then we have Mr. Sandman making uh, another successful debut. Aaron Ryan uh, from Dublin, Ireland, uh, obviously featured a bunch of Irish stereotypes. But again, like a lot of characters in Super Punch Out, I don't, I don't really think like he doesn't really stand out to me he's not a character that i'm like oh aaron ryan i remember that guy yeah yeah i mean uh he did i was surprised when he ended up on the wii version but we'll talk about that in a little bit um then we got heike kagero who is a japanese kabuki uh interesting choice i would say yep Yep. um mad clown who is (laughs) a clown from a traveling circus in italy and what I love about Mad Clown is his backstory, because it's needlessly complicated. <laughs> it's, it really is. He was originally an opera singer, who then joined the circus after he had a nervous breakdown, and then left the circus to become a boxer. We need to gather up all the instruction books for all the video <laughs> games through the 80s and 90s, and just compile a list of ridiculous backstories and that's a podcast episode i would say yeah i would agree like remember remember the metal gear yes uh snake's revenge instruction book (laughs) oh my lord the contra ones oh excellent (laughs) uh but again mad clown like is there anything about him that was was interesting or fun he was a clown You know what? What can I do? Right, it I'm, needed I'm to happen eventually. A bit. They just they were yeah. missing something, and it was a clown. Um, Pretty much, yeah. Super Macho Man, uh, Narciss Prince, who is uh, an Ivy Leaguer from London, England. I I hate his character design. I'm not gonna lie. I think it's <laughs> I think it's terrible. He kind of looks like a Super Saiyan to me. He really, really does. He looks like <laughs> he looks like a combination of all the androids. Yeah, is what he looks <laughs> yeah. like. I mean, I like I like his idea of being like the annoying aristocrat, you know, Ivy League character. Yeah. 
Uh, but yeah, this uh, this Akira Toriyama inspired <laughs> design is no. not not cutting there it. There will only be one Snob King, and his name is Don Flamenco, and he will be respected, Paul. <laughs> um, and then Hoi Kwar Lo, who is a sort of Chinese parody of Kung Fu masters. Um, and I, I learned, I was interested if this is wrong, nobody at me. Cause this, I just read this off somewhere, but I've, I've read that his name translates to twice cooked pork. <laughs> Which, I hope somebody adds you. I want to know the answer. <laughs> Which, I mean, God, you would think they'd learn, right? You would think that we'd slowly start to see a little bit of a of a trend away because they were deep into consoles at this point. And Nintendo was known for censuring other people insanely strictly. Yeah. But the fact that they're still like, yeah, you know, we can we can get away with some of this stuff. <laughs> I, I don't know man and then uh you get the the twins rick and nick bruiser as the final bosses um one thing i did want to ask you paul um i don't know well i guess first i would like to ask you is what was your experience with super punch out um and then as far as we know that mike tyson was sort of this big mega boss that like is spoken about even today as like a very impressive feat to defeat was that the same case for like Rick and Nick Bruiser? Like, was was beating Super Punch Out sort of a a milestone for a gamer? I'll 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 just answer all of that kind of in once. So, mm. my experience with Super Punch Out is I played it at a friend's house when I was a kid. Okay, and it was fun. And then we went back to Street Fighter Two. Okay, because that's just what happened. Yeah. back then, right? So, Super Punch Out, not as well beloved mm -hmm. as the nes game and also sold less too i think the nes game sold like two to three million copies and super punch maybe sold out or maybe sold one million okay which is still fantastic just you know not as much as the nes game yeah so you know as far as the bruisers go i don't know i never beat them i i played the game yesterday mm -hmm. uh in prep for the i love calling it prep you for were the ripping through the circuits man you were i was i was destroying everyone because it's so it's so much like punch out mm -hmm. right like once you kind of know what to look for and and the feel and when to dodge and so on yeah like i was just tearing right through the game but i didn't get to rick and nick bruiser unfortunately i had other stuff to do which by the way a little bit of a humble brag there right <laughs> like i'm implying that yeah of course i would have i could have definitely done it if i had wanted to <laughs> <laughs> but I had other things come up, so I didn't. <laughs> uh, so no, I, I didn't get to Rick and Nick Bruiser, and therefore I can't tell you if they are a boss that is on par with Mike Tyson. Mm. That said, I can pretty much 100% tell you that they are bosses not on par okay. with Mike Tyson. Yeah. And the reason I say that is because you would know. Yeah. You wouldn't be asking that question if the answer was yes. Mm -hmm. Know what I'm saying? Yeah, absolutely. Fair enough. Um, one thing I, I, I wanted to know, because I've, I've sort of have a similar trajectory to you, which is that I, I played punch out, uh, for a little bit, um, you know, when I was older, um, not when I was a kid and I played a little bit of super punch out and I find myself really enjoying it. And I can't really say for certain which game I think is better. I think that punch out sort of state is more memorable and it, it it's more indelible in my mind where super punch out i sort of go in and out of remembering things from but you mentioned street fighter 2 and i think it's worth saying that i a lot of games around this time period sort of lost their lunch to street fighter 2 like if street fighter 2 had not come out maybe some of these other games would be a little bit better remembered but ultimately, yeah. do you think that Super Punch-Out improves on Punch-Out? Do you think that Punch-Out was just sort of that good that Super Punch-Out just missed the mark? Super Punch-Out, I think, was a victim of its era. Mm -hmm. Because Punch-Out Punch at its core is a very, very simple game. Yeah. And I think that's where its appeal lies. Mm -hmm. And so at the beginning, mid 16-bit era, games are getting a little more complex and people are eating that up. Yeah. And a game like Super Punch-Out might suffer by comparison. In fact, it's it's almost almost even more simple than the NES game because Super Punch-Out was meant to be 
a translation of the arcade Super Punch Out. Yeah. So it, it there's a little bit of a different, slightly different feel to it than the NES game. Fair enough. It's only now, I think, that people are looking back and realizing what a gem the Punch-Out series is because of its simplicity. Because eventually we did, and I think you'll agree with me, I think we did get to a point where games just got too complicated. Yeah. The, the pick-up-and-play fun aspect of video games was not really... It just wasn't hitting anymore. Yeah. So at that time when games were starting to grow up, I think Super Punch-Out might have been a victim of that, even though it was still very well-reviewed. Mm -hmm. And it is a great game. Like, I had a lot of fun with it. I was just, I was totally into it. But at that time, mm, I think I think it might have been a victim. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's a I think that's a perfectly fair assessment. One thing I did want to let the listeners know, because I I like doing these little sorts of segments when we can find them, is that if you want to play Super Punch Out, um, I don't know what Super Punch Out goes for nowadays, but I'm almost a hundred percent certain that uh Fight Night Round Two is a much cheaper game. Um so yes. if you can find Fight Night Round Two on the GameCube Little Mac is an unlockable character in that game, but it also features a full version of Super Punch Out. So if you have that yeah. game, you can play Super Punch Out the entire the in its entirety. Um, yeah, absolutely. I think I think that's a really cool thing for people who like putting in a little bit of effort and having something that's just kind of cool. Yeah, like if you just want to be dirty and play Super Punch Out, you can play it on your Switch. Yeah, you know, you just get a Nintendo Online membership, you can play Super Punch Out whenever you want. Mm-hmm. But I really like this. GameCube EA Fight Night Round Two way to do it that that really that really speaks to me. Yeah, I I've always been a fan of games that include other games as unlockables in their system. Oh man, absolutely. That's what I want. You know what I want as a reward for beating your game is more game. Give me more games. <laughs> yeah. Um. And so with that, I think we're gonna move on to the game that I know Paul has has been really wanting to talk about to espouse the gospel of, if you will. Uh, we punch out or punch out for the Wii or however you want to pronounce it. It's just called punch out because Nintendo hates us. Um, <laughs> and they choose to punish us this way. Uh, released in, in 2009, essentially everywhere, including Australia. Um, which I don't know. I'm assu- I guess they didn't get any punch outs before this, or maybe they just got the PAL versions. Maybe. Um, uh, yeah, I'm not sure, to be honest. But this was the first Punch-Out! game, I believe, not directly developed by Nintendo. It was developed by Next Level Games. And they had worked with Nintendo before. They had worked on Super Mario Strikers, Luigi's Mansion 3, Metroid Prime Federation Force. Uh, yeah. That last one sort of not being the greatest example of what they could do, I'll say. Yeah, it's unfortunate because they really they have an excellent track record. Yeah. And uh, yeah, the word has it that uh, Kensuke Tanabe, who is Nintendo of Japan's kind of like foreign liaison mm-hmm. with their foreign development teams, after uh, after Next Level Games, by the way, Vancouver, Canada represent. Hell yeah. He uh, he went to them and said, "Well, what do you guys what do you guys want to work on?" And immediately they were like, "Punch Out! We want to make a new <laughs> Punch Out game." And uh, and Tanabe was like, "Really?" And they're like, "Yeah." And so he went back to Genyo Takeda in Japan, the you know the original creator of Punch Out. And Takeda was hesitant at first too. He's like, "Really? Like, isn't that game too simple now for <laughs> for modern gamers?" The answer was no. It was very well received. Yeah, it was beloved. I I just like to think that all these Nintendo executives, whenever they deal with someone outside of Japan, they're like, "What would you?" like to make for us nintendo here's here's our properties please pick something that you'd like and they're always like punch out f-zero and they're just yeah. like why <laughs> they're just they're just pain <laughs> they're like would you like would you like kirby and they're like no please i have no metroid no punch out that's what i want um but like paul said incredibly well received and i think part of it was whether it's fair or not i think they sort of went back to nes punch out they sort of i think used that as the blueprint for what they wanted to do obviously better graphics all the characters are voiced and i like that they that they took what was i think punch out's biggest strength was was his characters regardless of of what you think of them and obviously they they have their problems but they sort of 
worked to give them all backstories and sort of reasons as to why they became boxers. And I love that. That was like one of my favorite parts is like getting to a new guy so I could see his backstory. Yes, yes, absolutely. The The character redesigns are nothing short of brilliant. Mm-hmm. They are colorful, evocative, hilarious. They are so expressive. The game, they're all cell shaded too. There's none of this polygon nonsense. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Why did it ever sound like an old man there? <laughs> but it is it is a triumph. Like this this game is the truth. It really is. Yeah. Well, I like you said, I think the art style works perfectly for it. The the way they decided the 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 way they decided to sort of make the characters and the whole aesthetic of it is great. Um, one thing I did want to ask you, Paul, because obviously when we talk about Punch Out, we talk about characters, we talk about rosters. We haven't talked about them yet, but I want to read you the roster for Punch Out Wii. So it's Glass Joe, Von Kaiser, Disco Kid, who's new, King Hippo, Piston Hondo, who's Piston Honda, but they changed his name now. Bear <laughs> Copyright Hopper, infringement. <laughs> Great Tiger, Don Flamenco, Aaron Ryan, Soda Popinski, Bald Bull, Super Macho Man, and Mr. Sandman. To me, that's essentially a greatest hits. I can't think of anybody that they left out that I would want in that sort of oh, roster. Oh, I can think of someone. Yeah? A gentleman named Pizza oh. Pasta? <laughs> well, I mean, <laughs> Pizza Pasta is forever missed in every game, but I think that spiritually, <laughs> he's always with us, if we just believe. Correct. Um, But yeah, so in terms of the fighters that you get here, like... What what do you think, just generally? Because I think we've seen all these guys before. So the only point of discussion, I think, is do you think they did a good job in in which ones they picked and which ones they sort of left behind? Absolutely, absolutely. There's there's nothing to complain about with this roster. Everybody is impressive and different, and they all and they updated all the characters as well. Yep. They gave them some new moves here and there. So as much as this game is punch out. And it really is like you really hit the nail on the head. This is Punch Out mm. on the NES. Just it looks way, way better. The presentation is dialed to eleven, but they still give all the characters a little extra something, some extra moves, and mm-hmm. and so on. It's like Don Flamenco, especially. Like I remember <laughs> Don Flamenco just being such a jobber. Yeah. Like oh my god, he was so easy. And in this game, he's he's a lot more difficult, man. Yeah. He really shows up. He's he's now infuriating, you know, because of his attitude and his design, and also because of his skills, which yeah. is a really nice addition. I thought they were really smart to do that if they in fact did that on purpose. Yeah. I, I will say I have I have changed my mind. I've convinced myself of something. I would take out Aaron Ryan and put in masked muscle. That is my one change. Agree. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I think Mass Muscle would have fit in perfectly with the sort of over the top uh background stories they were going for. Yeah, um, and you know what? I'm also glad that they took out Dragon Chan. Yes. I will agree. Because I'm sorry, but getting kicked in the face is just not not fun. <laughs> it's, it's not, not. punch out, man. It's not. <laughs> um the one thing I, I well, there are multiple things, but the thing that I remember sort of standing out to me a lot when I first played this game is that when you become champion, when you go through everyone, it opens up, it unlocks a title defense mode where you go through everyone again, but now they have these new quirks that they've designed to try to beat you. Um, cause they, yep. they're sort of like, oh, I, I see how you exploited my weakness there. So now I'm going to protect it. So like Glass Joe's is my favorite. He just gets a head. He just gets a fucking training, like boxing training headpiece and you can't like punch <laughs> him in the head anymore. <laughs> <laughs> he's the best yeah i think uh i think uh bear hugger gets a squirrel that sort of helps him out um yeah yeah king, hides hippo, under his toque. king hippo tapes a manhole cover to his belly so you have to undo <laughs> the tape that's holding it oh man it's it's great they really gosh they did such a good job with this game like the the controls are super tight although i do have to say uh yesterday i tried it out with the Wii Fit board, yeah, and like the nunchuck, and oh uh, god, <laughs> oh man, you can beat Glass Joe on the Wii Fit board. You could even beat Von Kaiser. Once I got to Disco Kid, though, I was like, all right, I got to start using an actual <laughs> controller here. This is this is just not going to cut it. Though it's fun, like yeah. the Wii Fit board standing on it and using it to dodge, yeah. like the actual 
motion and the connection you feel with the game in that sense is a lot of fun. Was it responsive? But, like, like did it did it track your movement it's, pretty well? It's too responsive. Oh wow. That's the problem. So like when I dodge to the right, what you do is you kind of put more weight on your right foot. Mm -hmm. But when you take the weight off your right foot, you have to somehow go back to neutral. Yeah. And what was happening with me is I would take my weight off my right foot and then I would put too much on my left. And it would automatically the dodge the other way. And it would automatically, exactly, you want to dodge and counter, but instead I would just dodge two ways. Mm. And so I was missing a lot of, a lot of counterattack opportunities because of that. So it was fun, but, you know, it, it winning is also fun. Yeah. Now, when I, I find a video like of a 12-year-old who beat the game on the Wii board, blindfolded with both hands tied behind his oh, back. Oh, my God. I just opened myself up right now. Oh, uh, man. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. And so what, one, um, one aspect of this game that was also really cool was that there was just content. Content upon content upon content. They took... What I think you would see is like very simple, right? Like 13 fighters, one guy. Like how can we make a really immersive experience out of this? But you've got the first run. You've got title defense. If you're insane enough to beat title defense, then you get last stand where you essentially just fight random opponents, um, including Donkey Kong, who only appears in last stand, which was a very yeah. nice little Easter egg. Um, and basically, once you, if you are able to win 10 matches... In this mode, you unlock champion mode for exhibition play, which basically means that if you get hit one time, you're just done. You automatically lose. Um, yeah. And then if that wasn't sadistic enough in last stand, if you lose three times, Little Mac retires from boxing, which means that your save game becomes disabled and you have to create a new save file to start playing last stand again. I can't tell you how much I love that. I can't. You've heard me. You've heard me <laughs> drone on and on in this podcast about how much I love tension in video games. This is it. This is it. You lose three times. You're done. All it There's does. There's no reloading. There's nothing like that. It's it, it really is the ultimate. It really just makes me think that little Mac is just like getting concussed constantly. And by the third <laughs> loss, he's just like, I can't do it anymore, Doc. Like, <laughs> I'm starting to see stars. Like, it's really, it's really dark if you think about it. But he, help. He Doc. makes the right choice for himself. <laughs> yeah, he's like, help. Um, so, so, Paul, uh, I know that you've played Punch Out! Wii. I think we both have. We had really good experiences with it. What, what do you think of it in terms of where it stands? Like, is Mike Tyson, I know we already said Mike Tyson's was sort of the peak. And I think as a franchise, that is probably still true as far as like when it was most relevant, when people knew about it the most, when it was most purchased and most played. But in your personal opinion, where does where does we where does Punch Out We stand as far as like the the sort of ranking of your punch out games? Well, okay, the way I look at it is that if I was a father raising a young <laughs> child to be a champion gamer and the child is wants to play punch out. I think that I would show them Punch Out on the NES and they would have fun mm -hmm. because it's just inherently fun. But the child would want to play the Wii one. Yeah. Because the presentation is just superlative. Yeah. Whereas me personally, if I could only pick one, I think I'd pick the NES one yeah. because that's the one I grew up with. Mm -hmm. Right. So I think there's room for both of them, depending on who you are and what you're looking for in your video games. Yeah, I think that's that's the best way to look at it. It's really going to depend on when you grew up, which one you played first, which one you enjoy more. Because um, I think, you know, I think there are there are differences, right? I think Punch yeah. Out on the NES is strictly very rhythm game, very puzzle game, sort of pattern based. Punch Out Wii, I think, gives you a little bit of wiggle room in terms of how you can beat boxers. But it's always best if you know the best strategies to do it. Yeah, yeah. There's a little bit more almost randomization. I'd say in the uh, Wii Punch-Out, it's not quite as obvious mm -hmm. what the boxers are going to do. A little bit of challenge there. Definitely relies on the Twitch reflexes just a little bit more than the NES version. And that's not a bad thing. Hey, if someone told me I was going to be on a deserted island and I can only have one Punch-Out game and they gave me the Wii Punch-Out, mm -hmm. I'm like, okay, cool. 
I'm I'm good with that. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Yeah. Fair enough. Um, really quickly, I want to do a quick rundown of these uh, Punch Out spinoffs. Um, there was a Punch Out Game and Watch, which I found immensely entertaining. Um, it was released in 1984, so you'd think it would be like the first Punch Out, but it was initially released as boxing. And then once the arcade game became more popular, Nintendo was like, "Well, we're gonna call it Punch Out now," because obviously, right? Um, yeah, yeah. It's a very interesting little device. I I haven't seen any gameplay of it, but if you've seen a game and watch type game, I can't imagine it's much different than that. Um, it was the first purchasable punch out game. Um, and it's two players. It's two player compatible, which I thought was the best part, honestly. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think so too. Here's one that I kind of did want to talk to you about because I'm curious if you've ever played it. It's arm wrestling. So this is a Nintendo uh, arcade machine that only came out in North America in 1985, also developed by R&D3, and it's basically what it sounds like. It's an arm wrestling arcade machine. Um, Have you ever seen this? Have you ever played it? I never even heard about it until we were researching this episode. This is super obscure. Yeah, so I thought that I had played it because I had played an arm wrestling uh, arcade machine at Disney World in Orlando um, when I was, I want to say like 20 or something like that. But I don't think it was this game because when I looked up the machine, I was like, oh, this looks terrifying. <laughs> like, yeah. you kind of have to <laughs> hold on to this robotic arm. And like, I, I think as a child, I would have been scared that it was just going to rip my arm off. <laughs> um, so it features the only reason that it's worth uh, featuring as in this discussion is that one of the arm wrestlers is called Mask X, who is actually Bald Bull with a mask, who I think is revealed if you defeat him. Oh, an earth shattering reveal, like on par with Samus and Metroid, I would say. Yeah. Um, and then <laughs> the last one is Doc Lewis's Punch Out, which was a sort of WiiWare spinoff where you it's basically a club nintendo promotion like reward a platinum tier reward so if you didn't save up your my nintendo points or your club nintendo points you weren't gonna get to play this this gem um here's what i like is that this is the only game where you can fight doc lewis so if you were ever tired of doc lewis giving you his inane advice that didn't really help you at all (laughs) you were tired of running behind his bicycle in your hot pink uh sweatsuit this is the moment for you to finally show Doc Lewis how good of a boxer you really are. Oh, man. I wish I had known about this sooner. Yeah. Because, like, the swag, the exclusive consoles, none of that ever made me join Club Nintendo. If I had known about Doc Lewis's <laughs> punch out, I 100% would have collected as many Club Nintendo points as possible. Yeah. I, a- absolutely, I man. could be wrong, but I think you might still be able to get this somehow through the Wii U. I'm not sure about that. Don't quote me on that one. Um, But if we can't, then I'm going to be very sad because that would make this potentially like lost uh, media. And I hate that. I hate that so much. Yeah. Especially when it's something like modern. Like if it was something like, oh, this came out in like 75, no one cared. And now it's gone. But like, I'm going to, I'm going to, if I can't find a ROM of Doc Lewis's punch out online, I'm going to be very upset. Yep. Yep. Um, so that pretty much wraps it up for punch out. I think, you know, Paul, I, I want to leave the listeners off with like a last note on punch out as a series. So what, like, what does punch out mean to you ultimately? Like looking through all this, reading through all this history, what do you think of punch out? I think punch out is the ultimate example of less is more. Mm-hmm. I I really do. Like, I think that this game is timeless. I think the concept is timeless. And because it is so simple and so accessible, it is just plain fun. Yeah. There's an interview with Miyamoto somewhere, and I think it might actually be about Punch-Out. But basically, he's like, look, and I think this was in the mid-2000s or so. He's like, look, you know, all these developers are, are rushing to just add more stuff to their games. Oh, the game's not fun enough yet? Well, let's add more stuff. Let's mm-hmm. add more stuff until it becomes fun. And that's, again, this is a generalization, but that I don't think that that's the answer. I think when you kind of confine yourself to a space and have as few things as reasonably possible, and you strive to make those things fun, mm-hmm. that's where a video game becomes fun. I really wish we had uh, Mike, my buddy from Ubisoft, on this episode. Yeah. I'd love to hear his his thoughts on this, but 
it's something that I really believe, and I think Punch Out is always going to be the the best example. Yeah, I it's hard to disagree with you, especially like the way you succinctly put it. Less is more. Definitely the Punch Out sort of idiom or motto. I I you know I agree with you. I think that Punch Out is such a it's it's, it's the epitome of easy to learn, difficult to master, right? Like it's so easy to pick up and play, but if you ever want to sort of make it to that higher tier of fighter, you have to really buckle down and and sort of figure out patterns and do a lot of that stuff that I think as children, we didn't realize we were learning when we were playing something like punch out. And now as adults, we're like, man, like that was, that was some high level shit that I was doing as a kid. Like that's crazy. (laughs) Um, but no, punch out is, is timeless. You know, I, do you think that Nintendo should bring, should bring punch out back? I mean, it, it did. And now it's sort of been dormant again for 11 years. Do you think it's worth bringing it back? They'd have to wait an appropriate period of time. Yeah. Right. When they, when they brought out punch out for the Wii, it was like 10 years. Mm -hmm. Now it's been what? Like, I don't know, 15 years more. 11. Yeah. 2009. Oh, 2009. Yeah. Okay, so not quite that much. Mm-hmm. But I think we're kind of starting to reach that point where a new Punch-Out! game would be well-received. The problem is that with those cel-shaded graphics on the Wii, you, it would be very difficult to make it look that much better mm-hmm. than the Wii version of Punch-Out!, right? Yeah. So probably their best bet is to like re-release a budget version of it on the Switch yeah. that's like the Wii game. Yeah. You know what I mean? That That might be the best way to reach new players uh for punch out but as far as them releasing a brand new punch out game i mean i know from interviews that next level games wants to do one Mm -hmm. and they have ideas of ways that they can kind of refresh it but are we gonna see it i don't know yeah do you think it's it's there with it's there with f-zero you know what i'm saying and metroid and all these other franchises that we we want more of and nintendo just refuses refuses to give us what we want (laughs) um (laughs) I, I want you to read this Mike Tyson quote that you included here because I think it's I think it's <laughs> fascinating. It's not a quote. More, uh, it just should be noted that in an interview in May of this year, uh, Mike Tyson was quoted as being heavily interested in developing a new Mike Tyson's Punch Out game. He actually. He he's actually hinted that the ball is rolling on this. Amazing. Now I don't necessarily believe it. But he's interested in developing it through his cannabis licensing and branding company, Tyson Ranch. Incredible. Which is just amazing. What a hero. And I, I, I can only imagine that Nintendo would be just knocking on his door, desperate to be involved with his cannabis ranch. Yeah. And some kind of co-branding this, opportunity. Oh, God. <laughs> Miyamoto just rolling up a spliff on, <laughs> on the next... Club Nint- Nintendo Treehouse or whatever they call it now. <laughs> Nintendo Direct, that's what it's called. Yes, yes. Um, no, I I will say I, I would love to see a new Punch-Out! game. I want to I run something by you because one of the things that is obviously, you know, in every podcast and every sort of discussion about Punch-Out!, you always hear about, obviously, the, the negative connotations of the characters and sort of the stereotypical uh, embodiments that they represent, things like that. I would be interested, if Mike Tyson is interested in, in making a Punch-Out game, what would you think if they did a Punch-Out style game, but with actual boxers? And you could get, like, famous boxers from throughout history to sort of be in that game. I think that would be a lot of fun. I think that'd be dope, right? Yeah. If you got, like, Joe Frazier, make, like, Muhammad Ali, like, yeah, George Foreman. And make them, like, caricatures. Yeah. The problem, of course, with that is going to be money. Yes, of course. Right? You like, have you're to just, license You're just all never going to be able to license these guys. Yeah, it's really unfortunate because I think it'd be really cool to see, like, cartoony caricatures of these famous boxers. Yeah. Yeah, that would be a lot of fun. I'm too bad it's not going <laughs> to happen. No, it's, it's weird. For a time there with Fight Night, we sort of had the serialization of boxing as like fifa as like nba nfl and that sort of died out and i can honestly say that with within sports games boxing was always one that i enjoyed playing whether it was punch out whether it was ready to rumble whether it was fight night there was just something fun about boxing games and i kind of am sad that they're no longer around yeah yeah i i agree i agree but hey man 
We've got Punch Out to go back to. Yeah. I'm good. That's fair. So last thing before we close it out, Paul, favorite Punch Out fighter. Dude, I hate to say it. <laughs> Don't do it. But it's it's bald bull. Ah, there we go. Oh, you thought I was gonna go pizza pasta. I thought you were gonna go vodka <laughs> Dreskinski or something. <laughs> <laughs> No, man, I hate bald bull so much. It was the first thing that came to mind. It was always the first thing that came. To, and I can't I can't deny it. As much as I hate him, bald bull is a staple. Yeah, I think my I think punch out is one of those games where the more you hate a character secretly, the more you like them. What about you? Your favorite? Uh, I would have to go if it's classic punch out uh, Don Flamenco. Yeah, for yeah. sure. I, I, yeah, that makes a lot there's, of sense. There's too. a couple. Don Flamenco's up there. Bear Hugger, I love. Just as a oh big God, burly dude. Um, yeah. And then obviously, like Super Macho Man, always scaring yeah. the crap out of me. I, <laughs> I, um, I always loved in the NES game how he would get introduced and just like bounce his packs up and down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. And I was great. like, somebody at Nintendo had to put like hours of work into this, and I appreciate it. I'm here for it. <laughs> But uh, that's going to close us out on Punch-Out. I would say another successful discussion between Arnaldo and Paul in the books. Ah, so much fun. This ongoing series. We're taking a break from our Intelligent Systems Roundup to hit up (laughs) Punch-Out. But yeah, uh, as always, guys, you can find us on Instagram at Region Free Gamers Podcast. Go to Twitter at Region Free Gamer due to character limit. Um, we're working on a bunch of stuff, guys. We got stickers. If anybody wants a sticker, just hit us up, uh, Instagram, uh, Twitter, email, whatever you got. Um, review please on iTunes. Always appreciated. Spread the word. We love all you guys. We're working on some extra stuff. You know, the Patreon's coming up. Uh, there may be a discord server. If anybody's interested in that stuff that we'll be announcing soon as well. So, uh, Lots of stuff happening for us, guys. Thank you so much for making it all possible. We really appreciate you guys. Thanks, guys.